The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. It's time to tackle another romantic comedy, fewer breasts than Good Luck Chuck, but you could say that about every film ever made, including every adult film ever made. We're talking about The Proposal. What the fuck? Um. Hey everyone, this is Michael T. Bradley. And I'm Jay Wilford Neville, sometimes called Ford. And we are discussing The Proposal today. The Proposal starring Ryan Reynolds and Sandra Bullock. First, let's do a basic plot synopsis. Wilford, you want to you wanna take that on? It's actually a really simple plot. Sandra Bullock is a Canadian immigrant. She's about to be deported and lose her high-powered job as the editor-in-chief at a publishing company. She needs to find a way to stay in the country, so she essentially coerces and manipulates her assistant into marrying her. And in order to convince immigration that it's not a sham marriage, they go to Alaska to meet his family and hijinks ensue. I hope that's how every pitch in Hollywood ends. <laughs> that's how I would do it. It's wagon train in space, hijinks ensue. <laughs> Let's go over to our what the fuck moments. I will start us out. Sandra Bullock has never seen a dog or an erection. In Alaska, they have cell phone hunting eagles. Sandra Bullock sleeps with her hands protectively on her chest like Bella Lugosi. Coach? <laughs> Sandra Bullock twerking. Betty White to Lingit Elder. So there are a lot of really odd moments in this movie, and we're definitely going to talk about them as we go through here. But first of all, the big shocking surprise <laughs> for everybody listening and both of us <laughs> is that both Wilfred and I actually enjoyed this film. Yeah, like um, in general... If I watch a romantic comedy, it is essentially at gunpoint. Right. I know that I'm just going to have to accept that the gender politics are going to make me want to go out and cut 10 dicks off randomly in the street. <laughs> and I know that it's going to be so ethnically homogenous that I'm going to be embarrassed to be a white person consuming media in America. And if, well, I guess not necessarily a romantic comedy, but if it's a romance... If Nicholas Sparks is on the title, somebody's going to die. <laughs> and, and you know, at first I was just like, are we just reacting to the fact that our first rom-com was so bad? Right. <laughs> that we were willing to accept anything that got thrown at us? And maybe there's a little bit of that. And you know what I found interesting? I watched this two days ago, and in the intervening time, I have come to dislike it more. And I think there's something to be said about that. I don't know if you feel the same way, but I have this overarching theory, and I want to see what your take on this is, because this ties into my theory. I think that rom-coms, or romances in general, because I, I don't even know if this qualifies as a rom-com. The trailer certainly set it up as such, and the trailer was what made me think, okay, this is going to be horrible, because right. everything in the trailer was really embarrassing. Yeah, I saw that trailer, and I was annoyed and nauseated by the end of it. It's like two minutes of this movie was too much. I was not looking forward to two full hours of it. And and then the movie is surprisingly, I'm not going to say deep, but it, but it was surprisingly human. I mean, it felt like I was watching mostly human beings, and that's what I feel you should get out of a romance. I mean, I guess that, you know, the romances that work for me, I, I, I feel like there are people who I can relate to and who are interesting in certain ways or whatever, uh, rather than just a series of slapsticky sitcom level interactions. And then at the end, there's a cute speech, the end. The way that I felt a couple of days later reminded me of how I felt after seeing Face Off. The action movie with Nicolas Cage and John Travolta. Not the sci-fi game show. The uh, John Woo movie. I very much enjoyed myself for the hour and 40 minutes or whatever that I was in the theater. My best friend and I both saw it. We talked about it for a few hours afterwards and we were like, okay, cool. That was enjoyable. Four days later, we were like, that's so fucking ridiculous. <laughs> And I felt the same way about this. And I kind of realized rom-coms are the shitty action movies uh, of of chick flicks they they are it's it's like that you know and i i i don't want to stereotype completely but if we're going to you know i mean that's the category that we kind of know these genres by it's it's kind of in the same way that fantasy football is basically D&D &D for jocks 
I think that rom-coms are basically action movies for uh, women, uh, for want of a better term, because the point here is not this story is really deep and totally believable. The point is we have a conceit that we can make you believe for an hour and 40 minutes and you get to see Sandra Bullock and Ryan Reynolds fault for each other. So it's kind of like benefiting from a lowered expectation on our part when we go in to see that movie? I think it's also that you could make this, you could make the conceit of this movie, Ryan Reynolds is a bear hunter and Sandra Bullock dresses as a bear at the zoo and hijinks ensue, right? You could have any <laughs> sort of ridiculous thing that you want. It, it's it's just like how I went to see that shitty Jet Li DMX movie. And I knew going in, this movie's gonna suck. But I like DMX, I like Jet Li, and I wanted to see them be badass on screen together. So you've, and I got, you've lowered the bar. Yes, and even though I came out going, I will never pay for this movie again in any way, shape, or form... I enjoyed what I got out of it. And so I think that is kind of the appeal of a romance in a way. It's it's that it's just a very different thing. Because my issue with romances so often is I feel they're always these rich fucking white people who right. I just don't care about. And, and it's it, it's very similar in this one. But it, it's it's like... I, you know, I just, I, I don't care about their goddamn problems. And it, they did hang a little bit of a lantern on that. Definitely. Um, on that trope in romantic comedies of them always being, you know, upper middle class or upper class people. Definitely. And I'm not saying that this movie is without flaws. I'm, I'm saying that for what it's trying to be, I think it did a, a really good job and it was effective for both of us. Right. Where it breaks down is when you stop, uh, take five steps back and look at it, but I don't think you're supposed to do that with this sort of movie. I agree, definitely. I think there were a lot of moments where it was things were done or characters behaved in certain ways in order to create comedic drama but that were really totally inconsistent with the background of the character or indeed even with like the character's previous behaviors. It was just like they developed whatever neuroses they needed in order to make a particular scene funny. The one thing that I thought was actually kind of an exception to this was one of your what-the-fuck moments, the Betty White to Linguit Elder. They actually explained in a way that I thought worked later in the movie. But when it happens, it's like really are, are uncomfortable. You kidding me? Really yeah. uncomfortable during that scene. <laughs> I was like, I, I, this can't be as racist as it seems. <laughs> I guess Betty White is just crazy in this movie. Like she's just <laughs> completely batshit. Like that's that's what I was thinking. And that whole scene, because that scene leads into Sandra Bullock twerking. Sandra Bullock is, is singing Till Sweat Drips Down My Balls. You know, like you're saying, they hang neuroses on them, and they also hang bits on people that just don't seem to fit at all. Like, Sandra right. Bullock's character loves gangster rap, apparently. That doesn't seem to fit in with her character in any way, shape, or form. But despite being a, a rich, white, Canadian book publisher. like <laughs> Yes, who's had to struggle to become accepted as high class because, you know, she had nobody to rely on after her parents died at 16. And it's it's kind of, I thought it was implied that she kind of built this upper middle class background or the appearance of such so that she could fit in better in high society. Right. The part that I felt was ridiculously racist was the sexual molester Ramon, the swarthy sexual molester who can't keep his hands off of her and constantly is trying to come on to her. But he's just very cutely extremely aggressive and creepy. <laughs> did you also notice that he was Sitka Alaska's Uncle Ruckus? I did not notice that. How many fucking jobs did that guy have? And then at the wedding, I was actually searching the crowd 
of the wedding to see, like, oh, did they invite the sexual molester? And then he's the pastor. Right, so he was the pastor. He was a waiter at the welcome party during the first scene after they get to Alaska. He's, of course, the exotic dancer. Spoilers. He is. He works in the hardware store or the general, the general goods store. store. He had at least one other job. What was it? Well, apparently Uncle Ruckus. Yeah, so he's... <laughs> Uh, he's single-handedly responsible for Alaska's high unemployment rate because he is taking every goddamn job in town. <laughs> it's like he... the whole thing is that Ryan Reynolds' family, right? Like they have this big yeah. empire. They own everything in town. But they seem to only have one employee, and it's Oscar Nunez. Yes, he is employed everywhere. And the first scene that we see him is, is as that waiter. And even then, he is creepy and aggressively sexual. He forces food into her mouth after she complains, I don't like fish. And he's like, here, here, you no, will No, you love, love the sushi. texture. Put it in your mouth. Yeah. Anytime there's an aggressive male who's showing sexual interest shoving something into a woman's mouth, my mind is going other places. <laughs> and that's just that's just normalized behavior. Like, that's that's an okay and a cute thing to do. He's harmless because he yeah, has a it's... cute accent, probably, mostly. Although I, I was kind of impressed in the scene when he was doing the exotic dancing. But I looked it up, and Oscar Nunez, at the time that this was filmed, was 50. Wow. Yeah, I hope I look that good when I'm 50. And actually, incidentally, so was Sandra Bullock. Huh. And her face is stretched tighter than a drum. Like, any time there's a close-up shot of her in this movie, I'm like... Oh god, she's gonna, she's gonna split apart. <laughs> I'm assuming Ryan Reynolds is younger, right? Because yeah. they do make a couple of jokes about it in the movie that he's younger than her. Yeah, at the time that this was filmed, he would have been 38. So that is actually one of the surprising things about this movie that I find positively is that they've sort of reversed that normal characteristic. Like, you got whatever that movie was with Harrison Ford and Callista Flockhart when there's like 40 years age difference between the leading man and the leading lady. That's the normal thing is a much older man and a much younger woman. And so here the difference isn't quite so big, but actually to have the age gap go the opposite direction was a little bit refreshing. And I believe Demi Moore did that at some point, and there was a huge kerfuffle over it, yet a 12-year age gap here and nobody noticed. They did a couple of things with Sandra Bullock that I thought was kind of a, a an interesting twist. Like, for instance, you could in some ways view this as a taming of the shrew sort of movie, I thought right? that same thing when it was coming to an end. I was like, it's actually pretty closely paralleling the plot and themes of the taming of the shrew. But what I thought was interesting was, and I don't know how you felt about this, but through the entire movie, I'm on Sandra Bullock's side. Because she is... She is portrayed from the beginning as this ice queen. You know, right. when when she comes into the office, everybody gets on their instant messenger, their inner office instant messenger, and says, it's here. And the witch is on her broom. The, she is this scary creature, and Ryan Reynolds, at, at the end, talks about how he often wished she would get hit by a car. Like, that's how mm -hmm. he felt about her. Yeah. And everything. Be because one of the first things that we see that she does that is quote-unquote evil, I guess, is she fires this guy. She fires Asif Mandvi. Because she was able to get his author to say yes to being on Oprah, even though this author never says yes to those sorts of things. And she pointed out, you never even called him. And I'm like, he's a bad editor. Right. You know? I he mean, should if be he had fired. tried and failed... Yeah, that's one thing, but I was like, he deserves to be fired. You can't get to that level and be that afraid to take a chance like that. And uh, after that, she basically blackmails Ryan Reynolds, and her whole blackmail reasoning was ridiculously flimsy. Right. Because because it's essentially that... Uh, Asif Manvi. ...is going to fire him, because if, if she leaves as editor, uh, he's Manvi is going to take over as editor, and she's like, first thing he's going to do is, is going to be fire you, and it's like... I think that's pretty fucking weak to hang your entire argument on, but if we take it that maybe that's true, or even if she's blackmailing him, the blackmail is kind of the one big evil thing that she does in the movie, and right. Ryan Reynolds just could have said no, you know? Yeah, because well, the thing is that, like, all throughout it, when they're painting her to be this big, vicious monster, I'm kind of picturing, what if this role were a man? This would just be business right right like yeah if a woman is 
80% as hard ass as a man in the business world. She's a giant frigid ice queen bitch. Whereas like a guy doing these same things, they would have to go much further in order to paint him as a bad guy. He would have to garrot Asif Manvi and <laughs> fuck the hole in the neck. Right. <laughs> to portray the same sort of... I Yeah, through the whole thing, I just kept thinking, I'm on her side. And then Ryan Reynolds, you know, essentially once he's got something to hold over her... He just kind of turns into a dick, and I was like, I don't really like this character. Like, I, I get that he's been under her heel for so long, but, like, for instance, he, he forces her to propose to him outside the INS building very early on when he's kind of thrown in his lot, and he's like, all right, you have to make me editor, which I was like, okay, they're showing that he's kind of as shrewd as her, but then he forces her to get down on her knees and propose, and then he just walks away rather than helping her up. And she's in high heels in the middle of fucking New York, and I'm like, that's just a dick move. And I think it says something about me that I knew what brand of heels she was wearing. <laughs> All right. You can tell because the red soles. Oh, that's uh, Louboutin, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you notice that Kurtzman and Orsi, however you pronounce those names, the guys who wrote the first two Star Trek reboots and I think all of the Transformers movies paid for this film? I did not. I thought that was odd. I don't know what that means <laughs> or what that says about anything, but just an interesting take. Maybe they were blackmailed into making this movie. Like... Maybe. Some makeup girl that they both were boning <laughs> a, on a previous production had, like, written this script, and so she blackmailed them into making the movie. Could be. Another large point that I want to bring up is, the essentially this is a bottle episode, right, if you will. This is a bottle episode that takes <laughs> place in these two characters' lives, right? They are forced to be together through circumstances in a small Alaskan town for somewhere between two and seven days. It's not entirely clear. Yeah, Ryan Reynolds is taking the weekend off to go to his Gammy's 90th birthday party. And I checked, I actually looked on Expedia and checked, it is a minimum 10-hour flight from New York to Juneau. That's just to Juneau. We see that they have to catch a small plane from there. So minimum 10-hour flight, then... They spend at least four days after that, and it's never clear if they're ever flying back. So, assuming that they left New York Friday afternoon, at the soonest they're there Saturday afternoon. And or Saturday morning. Gammy's birthday is... Uh, okay. Yeah, I guess so. I don't know. It, like, it, 10 hours, like, it's it's Saturday morning before they even get to Juno. Yeah, so it's... it's I... Absurdly long weekend. <laughs> That really drove me crazy. And then the, the INS agent, who is uh, assured that they are lying, because it's really fucking obvious at all times that they're lying, and nobody should ever believe them. But in any case, he's absolutely sure that they're lying. He flies up as well. And then he sticks around for the wedding, which is awesome, to hunt down this one Canadian book editor. Right. For whatever reason. So for whatever time, they're in Alaska. My point is that this is essentially a bottle episode within their life. Social scientists have proven that the way that we form friendship, the way that we form uh, intimate relations with people is not a lot of the things you think. It's not like necessarily sharing interests. It's not this, it's not that. The number one thing that makes you form a bond is simply being around someone more than anyone else that's it it's just time spent together this is why stockholm syndrome happens you know this is why uh, uh, cognitive dissonance can make you be friends with people you don't even like it's just because they're in your circle and this that is why easy parents to... lie and say they love their children exactly so my thought is that essentially any two people who are put into this sort of situation, I mean, I guess this is the secret to buddy movies and romances, right? That as ridiculous as it seems, science shows that they're right, that this is how you get people to love each other or whatever. Uh, and, you know, I mean, like, for instance, I think of all the Star Trek episodes that are bottle episodes where you have the two characters who hate each other and then they're forced to, like, 
spend 12 hours in a mine and they might both die, so that adds extra tension. And at the end, they of course have realized that the they're both human, for want of a better term. <laughs> you know, they're both, that they have more than the dimension they normally see. And so that's, I think, I, I think it's true, but it also really annoyed me about this film because it feels as if they both, through the movie, are brought alive to the fact that they're both human. Like when they kiss, they kiss the first time when they tell their proposal story and everybody wants to see a kiss. And they, I, I believe you said it was what, Freaky Friday music there? <laughs> yeah. They kiss and it's like this magical moment and they both look at each other and she has this look on her face like, hey, maybe human contact isn't that bad. Right. And it just, it seems such a no-brainer to me, I guess. And it seemed like, well, yeah, I mean, if you spend a weekend with anybody, you're probably going to get to know them better. Right, yeah, it seems as though, like, in the ultimate conclusion, which, spoiler alert, they fall in love and decide to get married, they have mistaken a lack of loathing for love. <laughs> He even says, will you be my wife because I want to date you? Right. It's like, I, I now know three things about you that I didn't know before. Um, that humanized you in my eyes. Which to me seems strange. I mean, it's, it's like, I, you, in, in this sense, Enemy Mine is a romance movie, basically. <laughs> because it's a bottle movie between, you know, two people who get to know each other better, right? And, and I just, I guess I felt like... If that's the bar that we set, that's real fucking low, right? Yeah, I agree. It 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 seems like we're setting the bar very low for I don't know how how for what constitutes romance. Basically, the movie is confusing getting along with being in love. It's at least open ended enough to say that I, I I mean it feels as if this might not work out, but they're willing to risk it, and it's like okay, at least. I, I guess it didn't feel like some gigantic love explosion at the end. Just a few small questions along the way to that ending. Why do women always scream on the phone? Did you notice that? Every, every time a woman is on the phone, she's screaming, and that seems to be what I've experienced in my life. What's behind that? <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe they just don't understand how the technology works. Um, we did establish during Good Luck Chuck that women are stupid and that... <laughs> <laughs> that they don't understand how things work. So maybe they think that if they yell louder, they'll have better reception. Yes. So one of the odd moments here, I think it almost made both of our, well, it, it kind of made your what the fuck moment, but beyond just a, an eagle grabbing a cell phone, the eagle grabs the dog. Right. There's an odd little eagle dog napping moment. That dog... I kept thinking through the entire thing, this dog is symbolism, but I don't know for what. I don't know. It was pure white. There's got to be something to that. So it was I don't, like it didn't die when they kissed. <laughs> Maybe as soon as they have sex, though, it will vaporize or turn red or something. <laughs> Did you notice that there was a framed picture of the dog on the mantle in their room? <laughs> he carries it around in his wallet. Yeah, this actually was kind of a strangely chaste movie. There wasn't all that much sexual innuendo, and I thought it was bizarre how totally out of touch with her own sexuality Sandra Bullock's character was. She goes into the bathroom and changes into her pajamas, and she tells him to close her eyes so that she can run from the bathroom to the bed. She's not even naked. She's wearing pajamas, and she's so prudish that she's afraid that he will see him, even though at this point, because he's her personal assistant, we've established that he is the person who buys her tampons. I thought that whole tampon line really threw a wrench in the works in so many ways, because it's like... What better way to kind of humanize her than the fact that he's had to go on late night tampon runs, right? That's an extremely intimate thing. She does seem out of touch with her own sexuality, yet then she brings up the fact that she it's been 18 months since she last had sex, and I was like, what sort of sex does this character have? Right, I didn't I didn't believe that at all. I did not believe that this woman had ever had sex. I, I thought maybe back in her Easy E-Rock or whatever the hell it is, her DJ bass and Easy Rock uh, days, maybe. I, it, honestly, the whole second half 
half of the movie when they, like, humanize her. I had a lot of issues with that. I just, I didn't buy that. To me, it was very similar to, like, you said, you know, the librarian girl who takes off the glasses and shakes out her hair and suddenly she's beautiful. And it's like, you know, take a, a high-powered executive and shake her around a little bit and she's got a tattoo in memory of her parents and stories about going to r- hip-hop concert. A, a little odd. Like, she just was sort of this mishmash of characteristics. And the hat rack that they seem to hang this hat of neuroses on the kind of core concept that you had to buy is one that I've seen in a lot of movies, especially romantic movies, that drives me batshit. And that is this core concept idea that family makes you human. Like, essentially, because she lost her parents at 16 and had no other family, she has forgotten what it's like to have somebody care about you. And she has... Which is what they even say. They say that. That's Well, that's how I knew it. I mean, how else would I know it unless someone tells me the subtext, right. Wilford? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the only way to understand things in movies is if they say it to you. She had basically had two choices in life. Either she could become, like, ice queen of the bitches and go high in management at an editing company, or she could become Batman. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which, I, that could have been a much more interesting movie. <laughs> but yeah, th- this we are hit over the heads with this theme over and over again through the last half of the movie. For instance, Betty White fakes a heart attack because she's like, you have to make up with your dad. And coach, you've got to be nicer <laughs> to Ryan Reynolds. Look at his puppy dog eyes. <laughs> and I hated that scene because it's like, No, Ryan Reynolds doesn't need to try to be nicer to his dad. His dad can go suck a fuck for all I care. (laughs) You know, it's like you don't... You, you don't pull that shit on your kid. So fuck your fake heart attack, Betty White. And fuck this whole, like, family makes you more human. I just think that's ridiculous. I believe more the Joss Whedon concept of we make our own families. That's kind of the secret to his shows, he has said, is that... It's about people without families who make their own families. Yeah, totally. Which is something I really relate to, which is probably part of why I'm such a big Joss Whedon fan, is that, like, yeah, the the intentional communities that we build around ourselves are way more important. On a less intense note, <laughs> you know a scene's going to be good when Frankie goes to Hollywood kicks in. You just know it's going to be high-class quality. <laughs> That's, that's of course, the, the male exotic dancer scene, which, interestingly enough, right before that scene is a scene with Craig T. Nelson and Ryan Reynolds uh, where, you know, Craig T. Nelson is like, you want to go off and read books in some room? I thought that was odd that they try to portray... It's like you have this life up in New York City with your... New book. York I mean, City! Like... <laughs> it just, to me, it felt like... He's got a really high-profile job. Like, this isn't, you know, it's not like he's, um, uh, this isn't like the wrestler. Right, yeah, he's working for a major publishing company. He's the personal assistant to the editor-in-chief of a major book publisher. And, like, his dad's acting like he's embarrassed of him. And, like, his old high school girlfriend is like, that's his dream, not mine. It just seems really I don't know, sort of, I guess, typically American anti-intellectualism. Maybe that's what they were going for. I don't know. It just, it's like, you know, did Craig T. Nelson, like, become this Alaskan Kennedy by, I I don't know, like, roping steers or some shit? Like, it just doesn't, um, I, I did not get that at all. It's never addressed, yeah. And especially how, like, they could become such a rich family in a town of, 8,000 people. <laughs> yeah. Is he actually, like, I kind of suspect that maybe he's actually, like, taking that speedboat over to Russia and smuggling in mail order brides, and that's actually the source of their fortune? Well, apparently, he's smuggling in Cubans at least, right? <laughs> A few of them, yeah. So, you mentioned how chaste this movie is, and Sandra Bullock is so out of touch with her own body that she takes a shower without looking for a towel first. (laughs) When you're in a strange place, don't you always look for a towel first before you take a shower? Oh yeah, figure out where the towel is. Yeah, that's like showering in a strange place 101. Ryan Reynolds is so out of touch with her body in general, he asks, Why are you wet when she comes from the shower? Right. 
<laughs> so perhaps he doesn't understand showering at all 101. It seems likely because he uh, he came in from hard work and took off all his clothes and went out onto the what was it a patio a deck a veranda i don't know like right that's how he cleans himself after hard labor it seems is to stand naked out on the awning on the front of the house i think we're to assume that he was getting ready to take a shower but he does all this with earphones in and without closing any doors that was like, and this is actually, this is the scene that was in the trailer, basically. The, the, almost the entirety of the trailer was this scene of like them running headlong into each other at full speed while naked. Because she's apparently terrified of a tiny dog and he runs to the shower anytime he needs to go to the shower. <laughs> yes. That was part I didn't understand. Was he going to take his iPod into the shower with him? Why did he still have his headphones in? Because... He was full of angst, and that music that we could barely hear out of there was just angst. It was fueling his angst, man. He needed that angst. Yeah, it... it Angst! <laughs> it was just so... I actually like your theory that he doesn't understand that he was literally just going to air dry himself, because... Later, it's proven that he doesn't understand how water works in general, <laughs> because they're out on the speedboat, and she just, uh, uh, Sandra Bullock takes the speedboat and is like, oh, I just gotta get away from everything, oh my god, and she zooms out into the middle of the ocean, and uh, then she jumps away from the, the steering wheel, and so he grabs it, and then he turns sharply, and she falls out, and there's this joke that he's kind of, he keeps talking for a while and doesn't realize that she's gone. Right. And I'm like, okay, I could buy that he doesn't realize she's gone, but why is he still going full speed? He just <laughs> keeps going full speed for like 45 seconds afterwards. Right. Where was he going? She's getting deported, right? She's the editor-in-chief of a major book publishing company. She's getting deported to Canada. And even in the scene where they're setting up the premise of the movie, they're like, you'll have to go to Canada for a year, you'll get your visa sorted out, and then you'll be able to move back. In the meantime, we'll make off Asif Monvi the editor. And it's like, can't she get a job in Canada? Uh, is are yeah, there but she, are there no publishing companies in Canada? The idea I think is that she would have to look for a job and start fresh somewhere, but I guess she just really loves New York. Yeah, possibly she couldn't bear to be away from it for a year. So let's talk about the ending. The movie is called The Proposal, and through the entire movie we get like like a uh, we get two proposals. We get her proposing to him in the streets of New York, which is just kind of played for comedy. And then we get a second proposal, which is actually I thought a really done a really well done scene where they're kind of trying to finish the story of the proposal and make each other look worse and worse as they're doing it. And I thought it was edited really well and it was uh, decent lines, although it just, again, obviously points out they are lying. The other thing that bothered me about that scene actually was the way that she tried to make him look bad was by attempting to emasculate him. Like, being sensitive and showing his feelings is how she tries to make him look bad. By effeminizing him, And of course him, his basically. family eats it up. Right. Yeah, That so that whole scene was bizarre, but, it, it, I mean, and didn't make much sense. But still, when I was watching it, the main thing that I kept thinking was, is this really what they named the movie after? And of course, what they named the movie after is the climax, which is him proposing, and it is an actual, real proposal. But I, I was kind of upset the, because I thought, A... The final proposal of the film is pretty fucking weak. And B, it happens in the office where they get this Greek chorus of everybody giggling at them. And it just felt like, well, he just shredded a lot of her credibility, like all to hell. And probably just made it so that she's got to start from square one being respected in this office all over again. So I was like, that's kind of a dick move, Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> I don't care about your fucking animated mouse face. You are <laughs> being kind of a dick here. The other thing was, the one thing that kind of brings them together, it, more than anything else I felt, was their love of New York and their sh desire to be powerful people in New York. Because, you know, like, for instance, throughout the movie, we, we meet Ryan Reynolds' fiancé from years ago, who he had proposed to and said, let's run away to New York. And she said no, because she doesn't want to leave Alaska. And that's the, like, thing that makes her not a viable 
opponent to Sandra Bullock is that she's a provincial lass who is never going to fit in in the big city with him. And so I thought, why isn't this on the Empire State Building? Or, you know, at, I don't know, Freedom Plaza or whatever. You know, I mean, something to give it kind of a an epic... New York feel, and instead it's just in this fucking cubicle. Well, it was a bottle episode. They couldn't really afford to do any of those exterior shots in New York. <laughs> I, I guess not. Another one of the things that really impressed me repeatedly throughout the movie was actually the ethnic diversity of the extras. There were black people, there were brown people, there was a whole diversity there. And uh, in Sitka, while they were still in Alaska, while all of the characters really were white people, there were some people there that looked like they were of native Alaskan descent, at least sort of like filling out the scenes and in the crowd at the wedding and that kind of stuff. And that was another thing that actually earned some points from me for this movie. In the first class cabin on the airplane while they're flying to Juno, there were a couple of black people in the first class cabin. So you know that it's a work of fiction. <laughs> Yes. The thing that I was excited about about the end of the movie is we, again, got wacky end credits. Wacky end credits, we get a Rain Man reference, which I was like, really? Like, it really <laughs> seemed as if the guy off screen was like a stand-up comic they had hired, and they were like, just fuck with him, you know? Right. Just fuck with him and make sure they stay in character. So that was an odd end to this supposedly, you know, decently serious romance. I mean, I thought the comedy was pretty light here, and it was it was more like uh, just a romance romance. So what one thing would you change to make this a better movie? I actually was surprised by how much I liked it. I would put it in the not bad for a romance movie or romantic comedy category, not necessarily into a good movie category. But I think probably... If I were to change one thing, I would switch the roles of Sandra Bullock and Betty White. Have Betty White be the romantic lead? Yeah, I'd make Betty White the main romantic lead. So we'd increase that age gap and have Sandra Bullock actually playing her age. Playing a 38-year-old's grandma. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm down with it. I would have Sandra Bullock perform analingus on a stuffed penguin in the end. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's it for now, man. Wow. Yeah, the proposal. Not not a not a stab yourself in the face sort of movie. Good nope. deal. All I, right. I actually so, would watch this movie again before I would commit ritual suicide. So for now, this is Michael T. Bradley and J. Will Ford Neville. And if you have any comments, questions, feedback, if you thought this was a horrible movie, feel free to let us know. But be prepared to defend yourself, my friend. Info at IceOnMars.net. Until next time. You have been listening to Ice on Mars. 